As of April 23rd, a total of 35,000 persons took COVID jabs in the country. The NCDC reported Pfizer and AstraZeneca COVID jabs are available at this stage. The number of citizens of the Republic of Azerbaijan going abroad during January-March 2021 decreased by 8.4 times compared with the same period of the prior year and amounted to 111,000 persons. Following Turkey and Russia, Georgia was the third most popular destination for Azerbaijani travelers during quarter the first of 2021. 9.2% traveled to Georgia. After Bizina Ivanishvili, another Georgian billionaire, Mikhail Lomtadze is included in the list of billionaires of Forbes with a fortune of 3.8 billion US dollars and he is in the 812th place. Forbes writes that the founders of the Kazakh company Kaspi, Vyacheslav Kim and Mikhail Lomtadze became billionaires as a result of listing of Caspi on the London Stock Exchange. Total profit of 15 Georgian commercial banks amounted to 166 million lari in March 2021. As of a quarter the first, commercial banks' profit stood at 412 million lari. Banks' profitability was significantly improved in the first quarter as the banks had a loss of 747 million lari in the first quarter 2020 because of 1 billion gal were put in the buffer of poverty. Possible asset losses. And this is the checkpoints hosted and co hosted by Elena Kvanchilashvili. There she is, and myself. I'm Georgi Sakadze, and uh, here we are in the Forbes Georgia studio to talk about business and economics. Yes, it is Sunday, 10 p.m. sharp, and our team has worked hard during the week to give you all the information that you need to stay updated and form your own opinion on the main issues in business and economics. And uh, we have always maintained the political situation in Georgia does have a spillover effect on the economy and the way the investor and the consumer behave on this market. So, I suggest starting our review with the agreement agreement that has been signed by the ruling party and the opposition and which is set to minimize finally the polarization in politics which would definitely boost the confidence of our international partners in this country. What is your take on this suggestion? A very logical start of the checkpoints and so more than welcome, uh, Georgi, especially if we consider what were some of the assessments before this agreement that Georgia was stepping off the Euro-Atlantic integration path and then both of us uh, remember the talks that followed by the EU on conditionalities to get at least part of the external financing needed to fight COVID-19 in this country, citing some major reforms including courts and free justice that needed to be implemented and followed up. So since none of us are political commentators, thank God, uh, my suggestion back to you is um, to concentrate on those accents from uh, Mr. Charles Michel that have direct economic consequences. How's that suggestion? Fair enough. So let's start then. Let's start and my first emphasis would be what the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, said after meeting with the Prime Minister Irakli Garibashvili this week. Georgia and its people now need reforms for a better future. This this was the main message as Mr. Michel expressed his respect for the political parties and thanked them for their participation in the mediation process and for reaching an agreement. We must seize this moment to work together in Parliament for a better future. Reforms are what Georgia needs which will ensure a better future for your people to pave the way for deeper cooperation between the EU and Georgia, Charles Michel stated. And let me then emphasize what Mr. Charles Michel uh, said after the meeting with the President of Georgia, Salome Zorabishvili, the European Union is Georgia's largest donor. That's what he said after the meeting. He also said that EU was ready to continue to provide assistance in various directions once the existing reforms were continued and deepened. Quoting again, the budget of more than 200 current projects is more than 
500 billion euros, which focuses on economic development, agriculture, education, infrastructure. These are the areas where the EU is investing. 1.8 billion, billion euros is focused on infrastructure projects and green energy. Our readiness and support will continue in the future as we see the strengthening and deepening of reforms in the above areas. All this is very important, especially in the face of difficult regional problems, said the President of the European Council, Charles Michel. Since we're on the territory of official meetings in, in Georgia, Georgi, let us then proceed with the official visit of the Czech Development Agency to Georgia. Its head, Jan um, Silva, highlighted that uh, Georgia has a great potential and a turning point is the association agreement with the EU as well as um, DCFTA in the visa free regime. Just this morning we discussed the impact of DCFTA on, on Georgia, which is not negligible. It's perhaps uh, you know, smaller maybe than on, on the other two countries, Moldova and Ukraine, but that's because um, Georgia is further away from the EU. But uh, for sure it's the EU's uh, intention to, to allow for you know, as, as, as many exports or as, mu as much export from Georgia as possible. Further on this point, the head of the Czech Development Agency said Georgia must offer niche products like nuts, honey or wine. To his mind, there is great potential as the EU is trying to make all the conditions possible for exports and for economic development. Jan Silva advises Georgian producers to try to approximate the standards to EU standards so that the exports are easier to make. It's about uh, productivity of work, it's about labeling, it's about uh, uh, making the, the products eligible also you know, for export. So this, this, this pertains to, for example, uh, laboratories, you know, testing and, and all that. So basically try to uh, approximate the standards to EU standards so that the exports are easier to make. That would be my number one thing. And of course, the productivity. I mean, you know, we talk, talk about things that are outside of my scope, but, you know, the organization of labor productivity and all that. But the, but the potential that is there. And of course, it's been recognized by EU, uh, European Association countries. So. Uh, Georgi, we will focus on the uh, exports issue more profoundly by the end of the program, but now let us look at the specific sectors that the Czech Development Agency is supporting in Georgia. According to its um, head, Jan um, Silva. Silva, these are the health and social sector as well as the agriculture. Here is the reasoning behind such approach of the agency from Mr. Silva himself. So basically all the, all the projects that we do um, s somehow help development in Georgia and you know be it uh, I don't know in production of honey or you know beekeeping or there's another project uh, we we have a complex project in, in the forestry uh, forestry area so all these projects are designed a to help the development of land development of um, Georgian agriculture or economy and b you know if it's if it has to do with the DCFD for example to help exports and so on but these are always designed with the Georgian authorities so so always in accordance with the priorities of Georgia yes Elena and uh, head of the Czech development agency also declares that Georgia has become a priority for Czech Republic since 2009 Georgia accounts for a large share of the development cooperation in total figures. It's approximately 55 to 60 million Czech crowns, which is uh, over 2 million euros annually. This is slightly less than uh, what we do, for example, in, in Ethiopia, Bosnia or Moldova. But these projects that we do here are very, you know, they're quality projects. Uh, I mean, unlike in the other countries, we don't do large infrastructure here. We do. Uh, you know, smaller stuff, but more targeted, uh, what we call soft, you know, soft, uh, soft project or softer projects. Uh, I have to say that uh, within the, the six countries, uh, Georgia is probably the most advanced and it's probably the easiest to work in. 
Uh, Georgi, by the way, do you know that uh, our senior reporter Anita Badze found a young entrepreneur who currently runs the Czech company TBM Evolution Group? Yes, Elena, TBM Evolution Group is headed by young Georgian leader Tamas Chakonelidze, as far as I remember. And you remember it uh, correctly, of course, but let me start from the very beginning. Connecting industry professionals, creating direct and indirect forms of communication for players from different sectors, leading Forbes Fortune 500 companies as clients and a new strategy to present Georgia on the world map. All this is connected to the Czech company TBM Evolution Group, headed by young Georgian leader Tamas Chakonelidze. It's uh, the main domain of operation of TBM is to use various business tools to create the most relevant conferences and communication networks for the industry. TBM's uh, client list um, already includes companies such as Tesla, Microsoft, Royal Dutch Shell and, <laughs> and others. Despite the pandemic, Johan Elze decided to open a regional office in Tbilisi in 2021. What is TBM Evolution Group and what are the goals of the company in Georgia? The checkpoints sat down with Tamas Johanelidze, the company's uh, partner and head of the sales department. In my opinion, Georgi, Ani Tavadze will emphasize one of the purposes of the checkpoints today to find and showcase such successful examples. So let's follow the story. TBM is a Czech company which strives to create meaningful events and conferences addressing the most pressing issues of various industries. Each event is based on data carefully drawn from in-depth market analysis, detailed interviews with top industry professionals, as well as various business intelligence tools. TBM network members are the world's leading companies. The company opened a branch in Tbilisi in 2021. The expansion turned out to be successful, and the Tbilisi office showed the best results compared to other branches of the company. How did TBM come to Georgia, and what are the company's local and global goals? The checkpoints sat down with the company's partner and head of sales department, Tamas Jachonelidze, to find out more. Look, TBM Evolution Group, it's a, uh, by concept, it's a business intelligence agency. Uh, specifically, we deal with uh, Fortune 500 companies generally to organize for them high-level quality events. Events which pretty much covers all industries, starting from oil and gas to pharmaceuticals to petrochemicals to pretty much IT and banking sector. And these events are more of a small scale editions where 50 to 60 top decision makers manage to, during two days, usually benchmark and network with each other, look in which direction the particular industry flow will take them and what are the current challenges, obviously, and pitfalls that they are facing and how to resolve them. From the networking perspective, obviously all Forbes 500, Fortune 500 companies are key partners of TBM, started um, from, let's say, two days, uh, largest companies including Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Tesla. On the banking side, obviously, BNP Paribas, uh, Citibank, Deutsche Bank, all of them um, are TBM current clients in the, in the oil and gas industry, which we started with, obviously, Royal, Dutch Shell, BP, all these companies are our clients for past seven, eight years, ten years, some of them, and obviously for we are the go-to company when it comes to this small-scale exclusive events for C-level, VP-level executives. I would not say that, let's say, monetary achievements or revenue or profits are the biggest driver force of TBM Evolution. What me particularly am most proud of is the TBM team because these are industry professionals, usually young professionals who make miracles happen on a daily basis for those companies who specifically need networking and benchmarking with each other. What TBM does it, we, we set pretty much trends in which direction companies should develop in, let's say, upcoming short or long-term plans, doesn't matter, one year to ten years. And I overlook the sales department in TBM. Under my supervision are two sub-departments, so to say the end-user um, acquisition, which are the industry professionals that come to our platforms mostly to learn something particularly new and then obviously partner acquisition which are the let's say so-called sponsors those companies that come to our platform not specifically to learn something new but for networking and benchmarking and to sell their own solutions on our platforms. In 2012, I started, uh, we started with a couple of my partners, obviously TBM Group, and this has been a wonderful journey for the past 10 years, which still continues with, as you can see, Tbilisi office. It was my particular ambition for quite some time since, I would say early 
2011 to have a regional hub as well in my home city. Because from my perspective, it's nothing to hide. I believe uh, Georgian young adults and industry professionals are nothing less than Czech counterparts or Macedonian or, or British or US. We have kind of resources and we have a talent to sell. That means that I always want to experiment and to see, let's say, to what heights can we bring Georgian, let's say, young adults when it comes to, to give them a corporate culture in which they could thrive. And um, to give you the uh, interesting fact, in uh, all the offices that TBM EVA has organized so far, Georgian team had the fastest start. That pretty much speaks loads about um, speaks loads about the, the dedication that these people are putting in it, and it makes me particularly proud about this achievement. TBM was set up in uh, early 2010s, where let's say credit crunch was still there. It still had an impact on industry, and a lot of people were running away from the sector altogether. They didn't have faith that this personal meetings, the networking opportunities, would be something that could be let's say. Uh, profitable but uh, same as it was in the first crisis same thing happened in the second one lots of companies closed down rescheduled their events with hope that physical events would come back to face-to-face -face networking in the large congress centers while TBM is as well lucky and due to a tremendous amount of effort that we put into it we have a virtual platform virtual platform that allows us to copy paste pretty much physical event in the virtual environment with its own um, speaking opportunities, networking sessions, roundtable panel discussions and we didn't miss a step. Honestly speaking, only change that happened is from the physical environment we moved into the virtual world. It's, it's not common to speak that you know during crisis something went up but TBM general workload went up and the amount of conferences that we do went up last year we went we ran over 100 events that has not been even done even 2019 oh we have big plans for georgian office uh, honestly speaking with if we continue with the same pace i believe we can easily of course we will work still on the european market which is and will be most probably for upcoming five to ten years the largest market the Georgian office will serve, but from here, since we have a different time zone from the mainland Europe, we can still do events in Middle East and Asia, which means that we can work on different time zones, which will mean that TBM will be kind of a barter. It will assist and European teams and Asian teams, because as soon as the pandemic is over, my dearest ambition is to open that Kuala Lumpur, the Asia Pacific office, which will serve specifically Asia Pacific and will organize those industry specific events for that side of the world after which obviously the next frontier will be to open the US office and that way we will cover all the time zones that are available to <laughs> Mother Earth. Maybe one day Tazo Tamas Johonelize will end up uh, on the Forbes Georgia 30 under 30 <laughs> list as well. Uh, this is the kind of entrepreneurs that Georgia lacks and uh, that Fourth Georgia and the checkpoints try to find and set as a role model for other ambitious young leaders as well. Speaking of them, uh, congratulations with a very um, dynamic, although still in Zoom, but still um, dynamic presentation of the list of uh, 2021, 30 under 30. I watched it. It was very it inspiring. Was. It was. Thank you for that. We can now both see what Maria Madamia has prepared uh, for the checkpoints today uh, as a follow-up of the presentation of the winners of the 2020 list that you just mentioned, uh, which uh, Mariam hosted together with Shota Dirmelashvili, uh, executive editor of Forbes Georgia and which was supported by the Bank of Georgia. Yes, our viewers and followers in the checkpoints get the chance to be updated on how this project came to daylight. 
who has not dreamed of getting on the Forbes list, creating a business and career uh, that leads to a success and wealth. And all this is recognized and acknowledged by the global media, the most influential business publication, Forbes. We have probably all had similar thought, but before we take an honorable place in the ranking of billionaires, successful young people under 30 have a chance to read their names under this logo and brand. The publication started to discover the under 30s back in 2011 and since then we have introduced you to no face and names every year, the past of which then goes to Forbes' main list of billionaires. Young people under 30, their ideas, visions and projects have changed and established the views of the world. They offer us new rules of the game and at the same time write new chapters of history. This is a generation with outstanding innovations and progressive views. Most importantly, they are the ones that haven't succeeded at the expense of the legacy they have acquired, but only through their own efforts, tireless work and talent. Such people needed recognition, appreciation and support. So Forbes, under the leadership of Randall Lane, led the foundation for a vital project. Under 30 became a platform for young voices to talk about their achievements to broader audiences. The platform helped them get more attention from investors, customers, and the general public. Over time, Forbes saw the need for the project to become global and decided to launch in other countries across the globe. This is how the most successful young people in Europe, Asia, and Africa started to be discovered and introduced to the world back in 2016. The project faced some criticism too, especially due to lack of representation of racial minorities and insufficient recognition of women among young people. In response to fair criticism, Forbes launched several projects and published hundreds of women in power. It also began counting the rankings of the most influential people of color. As for the Under 30 project itself, a youth summit was added to the project and has become both a tradition and additional motivation for those on the list. The event was first held in 2014. In 2016, for the first time, winners from all continents gathered to celebrate and Forbes Under 30s met each other at a large-scale event in Jerusalem. The tradition was kept during the pandemic year too, although remotely the summit was still held. The Georgian editorial board joined the process of selecting leaders under the age of 30 later in 2018. For the first time, it brought together leaders in various fields and industries whose influence, work and achievements, along with real prospects, deserve to be mentioned and appreciated by special jury. It was not easy to start, especially because the process uh, was accompanied by many objective and subjective reservations, but I will tell you that the enthusiasm of the Forbes team covered the possible skepticism at the beginning of the Project Under 30. We were driven by the belief that in the most difficult moments we think of uh, Georgia's strong potential innovators with businessmen and entrepreneurs and startups with valuable ideas and modern technologies that makes it so valuable and distinctive to Forbes. Identifying leaders under the age of 30 and composing lists of under 30s is a three-step process. First, the recommenders nominate different categories of candidates in a particular Forbes application based on which a long list is composed. The invited jury gets involved in the process and eventually selects at least five winners in each category. Each category has at least two independent juries. As a result, we get a list of people, young people, who dedicate their lives to answering the most crucial questions in their respective industries industries and work hard to impart new knowledge to humanity. Unlike American Forbes, which represents 30 people in each nomination and a total of 600 nominees, in Georgia we have six nominations and five winners in each category, which amounts to a total of 30 winners. As for the categories, they include culture and style, technology, entrepreneurs, science, media, marketing and sports. For the third year in a row, the 30 Under 30 project and the award ceremony has become a tradition for Forbes Georgia. Therefore, the pandemic did not cause any disruptions and the event was held online.
However, the team hopes that this year is an exception, and once everything goes back to normal, the project will be accompanied by the first Youth Under 30 Summit, setting a new tradition in Georgia with a dedicated partner, Concierge Tbilisi. A great interest in the project is confirmed by the fact that the project now has partners for the first time in three years, with the Bank of Georgia becoming a supporter of the project in 2020. And so here it is. Forbes Georgia expands the standards set by the business publication years ago and continues the tradition of revealing the list of the most successful people under 30. The reason is simple. In Georgia, Forbes tries to find young people, ideas and technologies that can change the country and the world for the better, with the one main aim, to introduce these young people and their work to the Georgian society first and then the rest of the world. I'm sure, um, Georgi, we will live to see many of these people currently on the Forbes Georgia 30 under 30 list as major game changers, who they already are, by the way, and many of them on, on global markets. Definitely, Lenis. That's why we're doing it in the first place. Absolutely right. And speaking of global markets, uh, Georgi, we have another amazing story to share, story of uh, BioCure. Biocure, oh yes, that's uh, one that won uh, the TBC Business Award uh, for the best innovation. Am I right? Correct yes, me if I'm yes, wrong. yes. No, no, you are. Um, you're uh -huh. absolutely right. Uh, started with ecologist uh, Mariam Jadlishvili's uh, work back in 1999. The company Biocure's patented technology of isolating indigenous oil oxidizing bacterial cultures from spill sites outperforms any other uh, bioremediation solution on the market. Winner of TBC Business Award for the best innovation, Biocure is now moving forward with inter national partnerships to enter key global markets and we have to say that it might be a huge uh, milestone for a Georgian company to enter the oil spill management market uh, which is predicted to hit uh, 140 175 billion USD by 2025 as market estimates assert. So Mr. Tamburuja, CEO of Bicure Georgia, and Mr. Colin Donahue, CEO of Bicure USA, thank you so much for joining us today. The Checkpoints is happy to host you. Happy to be here. Thank you. So Bicure um, offers a bioremediation a solution uh, based on a decade of research. And I'm sure our viewers want to know what exactly that entails. Um, how did you start? How was the idea born? What was the initial investment? And how did you actually transform it into a company that offers this unique solution? Uh, well, everything started from Mariam, uh, our uh, brilliant scientist. She uh, spent many years researching uh, biodegradation of petroleum hydrocarbons in several universities. And that uh, grown into a research that and then a genius idea uh, of a unique approach how to deal with these uh, petroleum hydrocarbons. Can you tell us a few words about the initial investment? So how did the, the company get together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, basically it was uh, developed partially in university. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it was, uh, uh, finally it was developed in a private research company uh, that was self-financed by, by Mariam and several co-founders. And um, basically um, uh, the technology was developed and uh, was uh, confirmed and uh, uh, proven in Georgia all by itself mm -hmm. without uh, external investments. So can you give us a brief overview of the main achievements of the company so far? I know that, I know that you've won a TBC Business Award for Best Innovation. What were some of the other milestones of the company so far? Yeah, so um, this particular company, Bioco, is a spin-off of this technology and it was established in uh, 2019. Uh, and in several months, uh, we were awarded with a JITA's uh, matching grant, 100,000 lari. Uh, <laughs> and after that, we went through several events. Uh, we also were participating in a U.S. market access uh, program in Silicon Valley. After that, COVID happened. <laughs> after that, we applied to TBC. Uh, Business Award and we won this competition uh, of the most innovative technology of the year. Uh, Biker has patented technology that outperforms any other solution on the market um, and we have a 
it's interesting to unpack that. So we have the opportunity to tune in uh, the chief science officer, Mariam Jadlishvili, who you've mentioned a lot, and ask her what makes BioCure's approach so unique. So let's hear her out. I'm a biologist and an ecologist by education. At some point in my life, I had to work on my dissertation. While choosing a topic, I became a researcher at the Academy of Sciences. Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline was being built at the time. Consequently, I asked myself, what subject could I have worked on that would help my country in the future? That's how I ended up with the topic of cleaning up oil contaminated areas. First of all, as an ecologist, I started to study this problem from the self-cleaning process's point of view. The central question for examination was if nature had the ability to carry out self-purification. Then I deepened my research and decided to explore whether there is a specific mechanism for all of this. I have been working on the topic since 1999. Back then, there was a lot of criticism towards experiments in this regard. Everyone was telling me that I would fail. I believe that there is no mechanism in nature that humans cannot repeat if we do it right. The process of self-purification is exactly the same as using the human immune system to defeat a disease. I was very confident in my truth because the only right thing, in my opinion, that can be used in this world is what nature and the biosphere itself have to offer. I continued to work and experiment. It isn't easy to get the interdisciplinary intersection point. Let me explain what I mean. Microbiologists go through a tiny incision and look for a single universal use organism. The microbiologists work based on microorganisms. Ecologists view everything as a system and cannot imagine how one can take some mechanism out of the whole system and use it separately. Biochemists view this process only in terms of biochemical formulas. But if you put it all together, it turns out that you will come up with an answer. My discover was to combine all these things and find an intersection point, as I mentioned. So all of this has led to BioCure's unique approach to use only local bacterial cultures guaranteeing maximum efficiency of biodegradation and avoiding off-target ecological impacts. So back to the CEOs, I want you to tell me a bit about your partners. So who are you currently supplying to and how do you generally operate from uh, Georgia? Yeah, so basically, uh, for the moment, we operate in Georgia. Uh, we have uh, a lab and production unit here in Georgia. Working principle is really simple. We need samples from the polluted, pollut polluted place. Uh, we isolate the native uh, bacterial culture from that particular sample. We grow them in bioreactors, uh, making the treatment solution. Uh, that we send to our customers and they only need to sprinkle it over the pollution. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, really, really simple, like send us a sample and get the treatment solution that only needs to be uh, sprayed over the polluted area. Yeah, and that's even you know people sending sample from France for a very difficult problem, and 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 you all sent them something in the mail that helped them solve it. So yeah, yeah, pretty, definitely. pretty cool stuff. Simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we basically we are taking all this science uh, tinkering uh, to our lab, and customers only need to s spray it over. Mm -hmm. That's it. So let us contextualize the importance of this uh, solution a little bit um, in the global context. Uh, we know that abandoned oil wells are a huge threat for climate change and many of the countries are trying to implement policies or advocate policies that push this issue forward as well as invest in uh, climate friendly technologies. I know you're moving forward with this direction to um, have access to global markets. So where does Biocure stand in this global picture? Yeah, um, I think it's a, a very interesting point you brought up about abandoned oil wells, uh, because originally when we were talking about this, uh, and it's been you know it's been over a year, we've been discussing this, working on some things, and we were really thinking more you know emergency spill situations, right? And so um, at this U.S. Market Access Center uh, uh, training, um, I was also there working working with uh, Tamo and some folks, and we met with Shell Ventures. And um, I don't know if you know the story of 3M and the post-it note, um, but they were planning on inventing um, a, a strong glue for aircraft. And they accidentally found that post-it notes would, would stick to the wall and come off and not leave any mark, right? So this is a good example, and penicillin's another one, where you think you're going in one direction, and really something comes up where you, you have this light bulb moment, and it's like, oh wow, there's an opportunity here. So oil spills uh, globally are a huge problem. I mean, there are probably millions of spills all over the place that are polluting the environment, sometimes damaging water supplies. <clears throat> but what, what happened in this last year is when we met with Shell Ventures, 
um, uh, Phoebe Wang asked us, hey, um, would this work on oil wells, like decommissioning oil wells? And we're like, yeah, it probably would, like, but why, it's small projects, why would we want to do that? But as you know, you listen to your customer, right? And so we, as we researched this, we realized a tremendous problem. Like in the US, 3.2 million abandoned oil wells. And as, as things transition away from, from oil somewhat, and as wells age, you're gonna have more and more of this coming online. And that's a problem for the climate because um, if they're not capped and cleaned up properly, they can off-gas methane. And methane's you know, dozens of times more dangerous to the environment than CO2 is. So this is a tremendous problem. In the US, it's number 10 of the sources of greenhouse gas in the country, in the US. Um, uh, additionally, um, you know, the, the emissions are the equivalent of 1.5 million cars. So if, if we can tackle this problem, we, we basically take the emissions from a million and a half cars and, and cancel that out. Um, so yeah, so we ended up focusing more on oil well closure. We don't cap the wells, but we make it less expensive to clean up the sites and basically accelerate the rate of change. Um, so that's really the market entry we're looking for into the US. So this is our, this is our, our route in. We want to get a lot of projects on the ground very, very quickly so US scientists can verify, hey, this stuff works. We also have like several uh, abandoned wells uh, that are also polluted and we just ask for the uh, conf confirmation pilot project or demonstration project and like uh, uh, several weeks ago we signed the MOU mm -hmm. with the agency and we already have a uh, well that we will be demonstrating our uh, technology now. That's great to hear. Um, and I want to end with a few words about um, your future plans. I mean, you've already touched upon that, but um, uh, what can we expect from Biocure in the future? Maybe access to different markets other than the US, uh, expansion of your technology? Very quickly, we'll be um, <clears throat> moving into certain partnerships in the US um, that are kind of based on existing relationships, right? Uh, so I advised at Tech Growth Ohio and um, uh, the Ohio University Innovation Center. They have good relationships in the oil and gas industry. So we're going to be working with them to, to reach out to some of the customers that they work with on well closure, spina, um, the cleanup of spills, so on and so forth. So we'll be doing that. Um, also, at the same time, we, we will be doing a, a fundraise. Pretty much at this point, a friends and family round. We don't need millions of dollars. Um, we basically just need some very... Um, very good partners so that we're able to hit the ground, demonstrate this, and, and set the stage for rapid expansion. The, the, the big opportunity right now is that there are billions of dollars of new money going into well cleanups. Canada already appropriated $1.7 billion just for well cleanups in Canada. In the U.S., there's a bill that's a $8 billion bill, another bill that's a $16, $16 billion bill. So we estimate probably a $10 billion new market opening in the U.S. just for well closures from the government side, in addition to the bonds from the oil companies, in addition to what the oil companies are already cleaning up. So even though we're not going to get the whole $10 billion, if we get a small portion of the cleanups, that are, where there's more significant oil pollution. This is a tremendous way to accelerate this thing like faster than any startup I know in Georgia. So I think this highlights one thing that's very important for Georgia to think about. Right now, the transition uh, to, to dealing with issues of climate change is tremendously important. And there's a tremendous amount of capital and a tremendous amount of support that's being put towards solving climate change. So if Georgia can take this project and some other projects and become visible with climate solutions, that's a tremendous opportunity for the country and a tremendous opportunity for entrepreneurs to both grow great businesses quickly uh, and also do something very, very important for the planet. Thank you. Amazing indeed. And let's say in the area of global trade, more so that uh, Geostat, uh, Georgia's statistics department, gave us statistics this week on what uh, we trade and where, I think it will be useful to take a look. Imports in January, March 2021 stood at about uh, 2 million US dollars, which is 2.4% lower. In the same period, the share of the top 10 trading partners by exports in the total exports of Georgia amounted to 77%. Uh, the top partners were again China, uh, it's uh, 110 million US dollars, Russia and Azerbaijan. 
uh, Georgia received um, $821 million from exports in January, March 2021. In the same period, copper ores and concentrates reclaimed the first uh, place in the list of top export items with a share of um, around 19% uh, percent of total exports, followed by the exports of motor cars uh, with around 11% percent, and the ferro alloys exports cons um, constituting uh, around 10% percent of the total exports. Overall, exports have grown yeah. by 5.2%, percent, but here is an interesting trend. If we look at uh, Georgian exports by country groups in January, March 2021, we will clearly see that EU countries, uh, it's 19.1% um, uh, of shares, CAS country is around 45% percent, and other countries are around 36%. Percent. We asked uh, UGBC to analyze this uh, trend for, for our viewers and followers. I came here to talk about the, the current um, numbers, trade numbers that, that we saw. What we definitely see is that the uh, share of uh, EU uh, market and trade with EU um, is uh, shrinking. Uh, what is the reason behind that and is the pandemic the primary reason for that? As we see, generally due to pandemic, uh, consumption is decreased for those uh, products are mostly exported from Georgia, I mean alcoholic and no alcoholic beverages. But uh, as we see, there is a growth of exports to CIS countries, but this tendency has been noticed even before. Uh, I should uh, emphasize challenges of uh, exporting to EU market facing uh, local companies. One of the biggest challenges actually is the transportation cost and logistics. And another issue is uh, to produce uh, big volumes of the uh, products to enter those uh, hypermarkets and chains uh, in the EU countries. Uh, as for uh, CIS uh, markets, it's much easier to access those markets uh, due to transportation issues and lower requirements. But anyway, we are convincing uh, business community that uh, EU market is predictable one and a reliable partner uh, should be considered as a best option for, for trade promotion. Mm -hmm. In, in uh, these times of pandemic, we have heard from many business associations to um, kind of postpone uh, the harmonization uh, process uh, with, uh, with the EU, which also include those rules that uh, our exporters need to comply with in order to be, um, to be able to export to EU or mar uh, markets. What is your um, uh, Stance, stance uh, on that. Anyway, I think that we should uh, try to follow pace of EU uh, association agreement uh, and try to be to adopt according to agenda. Uh, for instance, I can mention few directions which is a priority for for UGBC and not only for in general for the business, uh, one of the part of the DCFTA action plan is uh, procurement uh, system uh, modernization and reform and uh, now we are involved in the process of elaboration new draft law. It is crucial to increase competitiveness and uh, to involve more actors in this sector and even more to promote additional investors in the various directions, uh, somehow linked to the state procurement, public procurement system. So I cannot say that all regulations and most of them should be delayed. It should be adapted according to new reality and maybe laws should be adopted, but by laws can be, can, could be adjust, adjusted accordingly based on uh, close communication with business sector and finding the best solution and best way out. Mm -hmm. um, the, the key word in that answer for me uh, was um, also uh, bringing investors, investors to Georgia. Do you think these two processes, bringing in uh, FDI, technology transfer, everything that is associated with uh, FDI is also closely uh, linked to the exporting potential that local businesses um, also can, can get? Actually, I think that uh, pandemic created also uh, possibilities 
to attract new investors, especially uh, through using uh, Georgia's FTAs with various countries. We are working on this direction, and the uh, state uh, has also interesting program in, uh, in terms of FDA grants, and it could be additional incentives to bring investors uh, in Georgia. Uh, but anyway, we are trying to uh, focus also on specific projects, for instance, in terms of logistics to improve uh, accessibility to the EU markets, we managed to establish in Constanza a logistical hub. Uh, and it is uh, very important, especially taking into account pandemic situation. It could be possible, it will be possible to shift goods directly from Poti to Constanza uh, and to um, overcome those challenges with drivers we currently have uh, due to pandemic. And uh, from Constanza it will be possible to distribute or, or to all EU countries the, mm, the goods and also vice versa, import from EU countries to Georgia. So what, this is one of the possible directions uh, could be developed further. Do you think that could be a, um, a driving point for the exporters to focus more on European markets rather than on, on CIS markets because uh, together with seeing the um, uh, shrinking um, uh, shrinking uh, market share on, on EU markets, we also see the, the rising share on uh, CIS markets. It could be one of the tools to develop this direction. However, there are lots of actions to be taken, including increasing visibility of Georgian products, especially in Western European countries through various means. I, I should mention European Enterprise Network. It's a, a unique opportunity for Georgian companies uh, to find potential partners. However, mm, uh, we need more active participation of state agencies in this direction. They have the right to include in those uh, in this uh, network Georgian companies. And we may uh, ask state agency to uh, cooperate closely with UGBC to increase a number of Georgian companies in this that network. Mm -hmm. uh, in parallel, we are working with uh, various EU embassies, EU states embassies here in Georgia to uh, attract more inter interests of uh, related companies in all directions, including investments, export, import. What is in all of this the role of the business community itself? Do you see this urge, this interest from from the uh, business as well? To and th does it see the the opportunity um, uh, that uh, accessing uh, EU markets um, can bring to to business? Actually, business, uh, I think, realizes that EU is a very important mar market in the future also to develop. But uh, uh, in terms of accessibility, when they see the options to trade easily with CIS countries, they, uh, they are making uh, mid-term and short-term calculations and immediately exporting. However, as I know from most of the businessmen, uh, they are considering that this market, some of them could be closed easily and we should adapt immediately to other markets. That's why mm, diversification of export countries is very important and business realizes this, but in the short term we should have also plan B in case of uh, embargo or potential embargo. Talking also. to a uh, uh, to the to the largest association on, on doing business with with the EU. Let me uh, put it uh, so. Uh, what are some frequently asked questions that that you get from from the businesses in regards to how to export to EU markets? Uh, actually, uh, there is a need for for finding potential partners, and uh, of course, uh, respective volumes is a. A key issue from Georgian side. Of course, uh, transportation issues could be somehow managed, but volumes is an um, important uh, issue. Of course, uh, in terms of wine quality, we do not have any any uh, restrictions, and it's the highest and also non-alcoholic uh, beverages. But anyway, uh, we should work more on marketing issues in in uh, Western. Uh, European countries, especially though where we do not have clear 
vision and knowledge about Georgia products. You mentioned that um, one of the barriers is finding the uh, counterparts in, in partners uh, in European markets. Why do you think that that happens so? Because um, we are um, hearing from to time to time and that is true that Georgia is among very, very few countries which has on the one hand FTA with uh, DCFTA and uh, also also FTA with, with the China, and considering Georgia's geopolitical location, that could be an immense opportunity for, um, for those uh, partners, potential partners of Georgian businesses. Why cannot Georgia capitalize on that? Uh, so I would far? agree it's a huge opportunity for potential investors to make Georgia as a potential hub and use Georgia's FTAs, not only with the um, uh, European Union and EFTA countries. But it's important that with Ukraine already we have agreement on uh, diagonal communication. This means that in case uh, establishment of joint ventures, uh, the, uh, these factories and plants could, uh, could benefit from these uh, trade regimes. It's very important. Uh, despite of finding of some potential partners, uh, Georgian uh, companies are facing uh, sort of a lack of respective uh, laboratories and uh, product checks because uh, in case Georgia does not have proper laboratory, they should send products abroad uh, for tests and it's a cost costly. Uh, for instance, we had the case in terms of uh, a potential export of uh, construction materials to, to even to Germany, but due to these checks and uh, not existence of prospective laboratory, this export has been stopped. Not stopped, but could not developed. For instance, uh, uh, other direction was a uh, honey export. F a few years ago, we managed to establish contact with one, one of the buyers, but due to this proper in consequences with the EU rules, one of the companies could not uh, manage to send uh, the products to EU. So requirements are in place, but uh, somehow government also should, should assist mm -hmm. development of those tools to support additional exporters to EU countries. Mm -hmm. uh, to sum up our conversation, what would be UGBC's recommendation in, in the, this regard? And these recommendations may go to uh, business community, to to the government, what do you see as uh, the one thing that needs to be solved in order uh, the pace to take off? Uh, very important is to develop a judicial system and make judicial reform. It's uh, very important for each investor and existing in Georgia and each potential investor could come in Georgia. And additionally, it's very important that the government of Georgia announced that by 2024, we, we intend to apply for EU membership. Mm -hmm. So we should look to all uh, Copenhagen criteria, it's very important one, and somehow follow of those criteria, uh, because it's very important directions contains, including uh, specific economic cooperation development with the EU countries. Well, I guess this is all for today. Hope, hope it was useful for all of you. <laughs> Thank you for uh, watching us. Um, and you know what to do. Follow us on Forbes.g and BM.g and see you on Sunday, 10 p.m. sharp. As usual, see you on Sunday. Bye. <laughs>